The days of the V12 are nearly over. The days of the V10 are nearly over. The V8 is doing its best to hang on. The V6 is even starting to struggle. The car industry is currently in a huge period of upheaval, especially in the powertrain department, and the vast majority of manufacturers have opted for one of these, a two-litre four-cylinder turbo engine. The list of cars that have two-litre turbos is enormous right now, so why is this the engine size and layout of choice? Let's start with the displacement. Two litres split over four cylinders. Do some quick maths and you end up with 500 cc's of displacement per cylinder. And look elsewhere in the car industry and a pretty serious trend starts to become clear. Let's start at the bottom. Three cylinder engines. They're generally 1.5, 1.6 litres. Divide 1.5 by three, you get 500 cc per cylinder. Four cylinders, generally two litres. Divide that by four, 500 cc per cylinder. Six cylinder engines, straight sixes and V6s, they're generally three litres these days. Divide three litres by six, 500 cc per cylinder. Four litre V8s, 500 cc. Five litre V10s, 500 cc. Six litre V12s, 500 cc. Almost every modern production engine uses a 500 cc per cylinder layout. So why is that? the magic number. Well, it all comes down to the shape of the combustion chamber. A bunch of German university students did a whole load of experiments around a decade or so ago to find the ideal shape of a cylinder for efficient and powerful combustion. And it turned out that a slightly under square engine came out on top. By under square, I mean that the length of the stroke of the engine is slightly longer than the size of the cylinder bore. Almost completely square, but not quite, meaning that the bore to stroke ratio is less than one. An 86 by 86 millimeter combustion chamber achieves that 500 cc cylinder. So modern engines slightly tweak that recipe to something more like 82.5 millimeters by 92.8 millimeters like in this Cupra. But I want to go further. Why is a slightly under square 500cc cylinder seen as the optimum? What did those German students actually find? Well, I've got an appointment with the best in the business to take a deeper dive on this one. But before then, we've got a new sponsor supporting the channel. This is for you Volkswagen Audi guys. A great thing about all of these two litre engines is that a lot of them share componentry and they can be very tunable, flexible to a bit of tinkering. And that's where one of these OBD11 adapters can come in very handy. First of all, you can use it as a diagnostic tool to search for fault codes within your ECU. You can also get it to send live data through to your phone, where in the past you'd have to fit a gauge for stuff like engine oil temperature, charge air pressure and throttle position. You can now get all of those readings and more sent straight to your phone. OBD11 is the first third-party diagnostic tool that allows real-time access to the newest VAG models, communicating directly with Volkswagen servers to unlock control units. You can also use it to change the configuration of your car to your liking. For example, if you want your car sounding at its best at all times and not have to keep touching that exhaust valve button, you can plug this in, hop onto the app and boom, completely deactivate the exhaust valve for good. You can also change up the dynamic of your car by changing stuff like completely switching the ESC off and sharpening the throttle response. These are all the brands that they cater for. So if you fancy one of these adapters to use in your car and to help support this channel, click the link in the description below. They have a whole load of pre-Christmas deals on the go. This thing caters to everything from a Lupo to a Cupra Leon to a Lamborghini Veneno. Not bad. Let's have a chat with the big boys. I have always wanted to come to Cosworth. The DFV, the HB, the YB, the CA. This place is a true temple to the design and manufacture of pieces of art like these. Bruce, I couldn't think of a better man to chat to about this subject matter. It's a bit ironic that we're standing in front of the 6.5 litre Valkyrie engine, but I'd like to chat to you about two litre engines, if that's okay. Sure. 
It turns out there's a bit of a rumour on the internet that German university students found out that a 500cc slightly under square cylinder is perfect for a modern internal combustion engine. Why is that the case? What physically about that means that that's perfect? So, uh, yeah, I hadn't heard that rumour before, which is not, uh, not to say... <laughs> it's the not internet, to say it's true. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But certainly, you're absolutely right that, that kind of internal combustion engines have honed in on that sort of 500cc per cylinder. There's several very good reasons for it. If you go much smaller than, than, than that, then you end up with a um, high surface area to volume ratio. And that's bad because, because that surface area, if you have your flame front getting to that, um, uh, the walls of your combustion chamber, then they're extinguished very, very quickly. It's that surface area where all the heat gets out of the cylinder and into the water. Okay. You don't want that heat to be heating up the water, you want that heat to be pushing the piston down. Yeah. So, so if you go too small, that's the problem you enter into, you have too much surface area for your volume and say so you end up um, extinguishing your, your flame before it's fully burnt out. Conversely, if you go too big, you have exactly the other problem, that, that your flame front um, progressing across the, the cylinder bore burns out before it reaches the edges. So you have what's called end gas kind of around the edges, which is, which is very difficult to burn. That's how you get like um, liquid fuel down the, the sort of crevice volumes around the top of the pistons. So that becomes very bad for emissions. So there's no, 500 isn't a magic number. It's not like if you go to 499, it's not gonna work. Yes. Um, but you know, in that kind of high 400s, low 500s, um, works very nicely. You say it's neither too big nor too small for nearly every application. And then it also sort of fits very neatly with most of the kind of car companies, vehicle strategies. You know, if your marketplace is driven by competitive pricing for the vehicle, that's when you probably want a straight four. Obviously, a, a single bank of cylinders where you've only got one cylinder head is cheaper to produce than a V engine where you've got two cylinder heads. So fits neatly into a two-litre straight four up at the other end of the market, um, say this end of the market. Um, if you're looking for a thousand horsepower, then it's going to be uh, you're, you're not going to get it from a straight four. Yeah. But, so. <laughs> but, but this has slightly strayed. So this is a six point five. So that's yes. slightly more than five hundred cc. So is that governed by a power number that you wanted to hit, or what changed this from being six litres? Yes, so when we went into this program, originally the target was 950 horsepower, and, and through the sort of development of the engine, we ended up moving up to 1,000 horsepower. Yeah. We couldn't quite get the power we wanted out of 6 litres. We didn't particularly want to push the rev limit any further, um, because at the time, 11.1 seemed, <laughs> <Yes, enough. laughs> seemed a lot in the road car world. Yes. So we said, OK, well, let's squeak the capacity up a little bit. Okay. And that's what I was saying earlier about 500 isn't a magic number, it doesn't matter if 500 yeah. becomes 510, 520, whatever. So, um, so yeah, so we put a little bit of extra on the capacity to get that target power without um, having to go even further on the, um, the revs. Well, Bruce, thank you very much for your time. There's two litre engines explained. To reduce production cost and engineering complexity, once that 500cc formula was found, most of the manufacturers decided to adopt modular powertrains, meaning that three, four, and six cylinder inline engines shared a lot of the same components. Before we knew it, all the local brands to those German students, Mercedes, BMW, and Volkswagen, were all building 500cc per cylinder, direct injected, slightly under square engines. It is remarkable what engineers can do with just two litres these days. Pretty much the entire hot hatch game is dominated by the two litre engine, apart from the GR Yaris and the RS3, but they both still operate in that 500cc per cylinder window. The two litre turbos start at about 190, 200 horsepower, but then the Golf R came along and changed the game up to 300 horsepower through Volkswagen's TSI engine, which is what this thing has here. This Cooper Leon has 300. And what makes this engine so impressive is how quickly it reaches its peak torque value. It gets there at just under 2000 RPM and then it's almost a straight flat line throughout the rest of the rev range, which makes it so quick. If you wanted that level of performance back in the day, there would normally be a transverse V6 in the front, squeezed into the engine bay. 
But those engines would only reach their peak torque at about 4,000 RPM, which seems like an age compared to this thing. Let's try that again. Fourth, third, second. Oh, it is instant when you want it, and it's everywhere. There's peak torque, there's peak torque, there's some more peak torque. This car is all about peak torque. What an engine. And by replacing that big, wide, transverse V6 with a nice, narrow, inline engine, you create much more space in the cabin and the boot for model train boxes and dogs. Then there's Mercedes AMG, who have taken things to a whole new level again. They are flirting with 400 brake horsepower from their two litre four cylinder turbo engine. That's 100 brake horsepower per cylinder or 100 brake horsepower per our magical 500 cc's. You don't have to hop back too far to when full blown supercars were creating that much power from eight and 12 cylinder engines. And yet we now have what can only be classed as super hatchbacks creating that much power using only four. But for how much longer? This era of the car landscape reminds me a bit of the late Cretaceous period. Stick with me on this one. The T-Rex is the V12, the Velociraptor is the V10, the V8 is the Triceratops, the V6, Parasaurolophus, and then boom, the meteor of Dieselgate hits into the world, quickly followed by the constant volcanic eruptions of Elon Musk blotting out the sun. And what emerges from that cataclysmic event? birds, the only dinosaurs to survive that extinction, the small inline three and four turbocharged engines, and then it moves the warm-blooded mammals, the EVs that will soon dominate the globe and change the environment forever. There will be a day when even these prevalent two-litre engines are a thing of the past, like the great flightless birds, the moa and the dodo. We all know what happened to them. They may seem a bit clinical and efficient to us now, but one day we might look back and think differently. <laughs>